Welcome to Connecting the Community podcast. I am your host, Marge Andre. I will be connecting you to people, organizations, and events that create community. I am creating this podcast in Richmond Hill, an eclectic and very culturally diverse community with lots of trees and streams and interesting people just up the hill from Toronto. On this podcast, I'm talking to Wayne Milner from the Curtain Club. Welcome, Wayne. Hello, how are you, Marge? I am doing very well. Very pleased that we found a time to have this conversation about the Curtain Club. Wayne, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, your current position as president of the Curtain Club, and you, your past involvement. You've been with the Curtain Club for a long time. Yes, 28 years. Mm-hmm. Um, and my background originally was architecture, and I got into teaching. And when I was teaching in Markham and helping out with the school plays, the drama teacher came up to me and said, I have a place you need to be when you move closer. And that was Joan Burroughs. And 28 years ago, I joined the Curtain Club. And I haven't looked back, I'm certainly more focused on the design part, but I have been um, public relations manager, I've done membership, I've been a B, B, uh, vice president. And uh, yeah, so it said it's been quite the 20, it seems like five years, but it's been 28. 28, wow, I did not think it was quite that long. Have you ever yeah. had formal yeah. acting lessons? I, I have actually, at mm-hmm. a Theatre Ontario Festival, I had the opportunity of acting um in a in a workshop um nothing terribly formal because that's not really the the area of interest for me it takes Mm -hmm. many skills and many talents to put on a show Mm -hmm. and my design piece has always brought me into the world of set design I I think I've designed over 30 plays in the last 28 years a lot of fun doing it a lot of great challenges Um, I did get talked into um, acting in one play back in the early 2000s and had a wonderful experience. Um, ended up the play went uh, and won Best Play in Ontario that year for my little tiny part that I had um, and had a great time, but I never need to do it again. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I, I respect I respect those that can do it and want to do it, but there are other things that excite me um, behind the scenes that are equally as important. Okay, very good. Okay. Uh, so and in this as of this June, you've become the, the president of the club and uh, very glad to see you take uh, take up that role. Okay, so we're soon to start uh, the new 23-24 season as of September 15th, uh, you open your doors. Is there anything new about this season about this year? So there's a few things. Now, first and foremost, it's our 70th season. Wow. Um, and that's a pretty uh, huge landmark. It may not have the same ring as 25, 50 or 75, but it's it's certainly an achievement. And we're very fortunate to have been here. Um, probably the other big piece is we've um, spent about $80,000 this summer with new improvements to our sound system, public address system, um, new video monitors for the lobby and for backstage. Um, some most of the work is done. We are still tweaking some of the stuff. Um, also, uh, a wireless headset system so that we can do communication around the building. Um, and you'll be able to hear music in the bathrooms and down the hallway. And yeah, so we're very excited. It, it's been uh, mm. it's been a while since we've invested in the sound area, and it was time to do it. And um, we are very fortunate that we are in a position where we were financially able to do it. So yeah. that's great. Very good. I'm glad to hear it, and I'm looking forward to really hearing it uh, yes, when I get yes. to go to the first uh, first show. Okay. So each season, at least for a long time, there's been five plays. What criteria do you use to make the selection? Like, you would never have a season of five comedies. Well, we did, actually, oh. and I can't remember what year it was, a few years ago, we and it might it was like a celebratory year it might have been our 65th or something but we did a series of comedies and even within that genre we'd had you know farce we had um 
you know, romantic comedy. We had some black comedy that, you know, there's, it's a very diverse range in itself, mm -hmm. but you're absolutely right. Most of the time, the criteria is to produce a balanced season that has um, comedies that will interest people that love comedies maybe the most, and that's a fairly substantial number of people, um, but also um, dramas that have huge audience appeal as well as mysteries. People love mysteries. It's hard sometimes to find great mysteries. Um, this year we've got you know mystery thriller with a bit of comedy in, uh, in our middle play, which we're really excited about. Um, and we have five, every season, we have a, a play reading committee of five members that read over, in many cases, over a hundred plays to come up with a well-balanced season that challenges our membership, challenges our audience, and, you know, basically helps us. Um, cause I think if we did, you know, five lights up, lights down comedies, we'd have no members because our audience, our, our volunteers want to be challenge we want to do creatively things that you know you can bite your teeth into and put a you know great show together um and we've got a long history of doing plays like that so um that's something that we're very proud of and uh, and our audiences enjoy it very good so this coming season is there a favorite that you're looking forward to something that uh one particular one that uh you're really looking forward to seeing on stage now, Mark, that's like asking a parent if they have a favorite child. Because um, they all have directors who probably want me to pick theirs. So I think there, there's, they are all wonderful plays in their own right. I'm very excited about seeing all of them because they have very different parts. And I'm actually producing the first play, The Five Fishers Companion. Um, and the director and the cast are bringing out just some lovely... It's such a beautiful piece about two men that have been friends since they were children and fly fishing together and they're getting towards the end of their life and some of the things that have remained unsaid and things that were said and things that shouldn't have been said all of those things and it's a it's a beautiful poignant comedy um you know it's got some very funny parts and it's some so you may need a kleenex and you may be laughing but uh i think people are going to really really enjoy it um, the 39 Steps is, I saw it a number of years ago, um, professional version of it, and it is just flying from the time it opens to the time it closes. It's a huge challenge for us just because of the the design challenges, the acting challenges, the physical humor in it. it it's a very funny play. Um, certainly the, the set lights and special effects challenges that comes with Death Trap. You know, it's a great old classic, but they're, you know, how are you going to deal with the crossbow? And, you know, there's a there's a number of things in that piece that is going to it's going to be fun to work on. Um, and then the Pugwash, the play in the fifth in the fourth spot, it's a fantastic historical uh, drama that probably most Canadians don't even know about. It's about the 1957 conference in Pugwash, no, Pugwash Nova, Nova Scotia that um, dealt with you know, the nuclear threats and, 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 and items in that area. So um, I think it's going to be really interesting to look at um, that part of our history that, uh, and it's told in a, in a very interesting and lovely way. And the last play is just a hilarious comedy that people are going to have a lot of fun with. So yeah, it's, it's an exciting season and I, I'm looking forward to all of them for different reasons. So that's kind of fun. Okay, well, thanks for describing them. I, too, now am really looking forward to the season. I always do. But, uh, yeah, thank you again for oh, saying good. that. Uh, now, are the plays the chosen? Do, do you have actors already chosen for them or just some of them? How does that work? So I think it's I think I'd be I would be inaccurate to say that the play reading committee doesn't say, oh, I think we can do this within our membership, right? Like if it if it's calling for, you know, um, five, you know, gentlemen, Chinese gentlemen, you know, we may, do we have five Chinese people in our in our company that can do it if, it, if it's asking for that? Um, so I think they're, they're definitely, um, we look at, um, are, are there the skill set within our organization to be able to pull it off? Um, that doesn't mean that the play reading committee goes, yo, Joe is going to do this part. That doesn't happen at all. Um, and the play reading committee 
usually doesn't include any of the directors necessarily that are directing that season. So um, once the plays have been chosen, um, we then put a call out for directors and producers, and then they organize auditions and uh, people come out for auditions. So um, the play that's going on in November, the 39 Steps, the, it has been cast. It was cast in June. They've already done some uh, rehearsals. The J uh, January play will probably be cast in the next few weeks. Usually the casting happens anywhere from eight to 12 weeks before a show opens. And over the summer, that can vary because, you know, people working around holidays and everything else, we, uh, we are doing this for love, not for money. Um, so we have to accommodate people's personal lives as well. Okay. So that that's, I find very interesting. I find the whole logistics of putting on a production or a whole season, uh, quite intriguing like do you have like a on the wall at the curtain club a chart for when you do certain things is there like okay x number of weeks before you start designing the set uh but when do you find costumes when do you decide what the lighting is like how is that done that's a great question that could be a podcast in itself so mm. we'll try to do a, a flyover um so certainly once a director gets a play, um, usually the director and the producer are looking for design heads. They're looking for a lighting designer, looking for a set designer, looking for costumes. If it has makeup challenges or hair or um, somebody, it, very complex props. Sometimes you need to make or find very obscure properties, um, items that are used on stage. Um, and often... Because the director, before before they can start rehearsing, they need to know where they're doing this, what the space they're working with. So um, the relationship between the set designer and the director quite often is one of the earliest ones so that this, the director can then start, oh, okay, so if the entrance is over here and there's a door there and there's offstage here or whatever, then they can start blocking. Blocking is organizing the actor's placement and movements around the space. Um, so once once they sort of get a, a drawing and often a model of what that space is going to look like, then the director can get more seriously into blocking how the play is going to look in various moments, especially some critical moments where they want certain views and certain things to happen. Um, shortly after that, we, they start to bring in lighting because and sound, usually that happens around the same time that rehearsals are starting, which uh, is usually seven or eight weeks before the show opens. Um, and that's sort of the, uh, the piece. The other piece too is um, with actors, you know, actors start learning their lines. Many of them start working on their lines the minute they get cast, um, but often, you need to move on stage with the lines to make the lines stick and make them work. So it's blocking and learning the lines um, tends to happen um, more consistently or more often once they get into blocking. And then hopefully um, about four weeks before the play opens, they are off book. So they no longer have a script. Um, and that sometimes is easy. And sometimes it's two weeks before we open them that they still have a script. It, uh, it depends on the play, and sometimes the playwrights write words that are harder to remember than others. Unfortunately, that, that does sometimes happen, but it is part of what we do. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. I find that intriguing. So uh, I may be watching the shows with a different set of eyes, having heard that. So thank you. Just curious about the, like the budget. Like Some of your sets are very elaborate. You costume sometimes i think they've just got the actors have gone to the closet other times no so is there like a budget for each show or yeah so that we do have a, a budget it's um when we do an annual budget we budget how much money for various things um so we we tend to do production costs and then sort of auxiliary costs some of the other costs like on average we pay about three thousand dollars per show to the party that owns the rights to that show. Mm, so okay. before we do anything, we pay about $3,000. If it's a musical, it'll be over $5,000 because we also get have to get the rights for all the music mm -hmm. um, and rent all of the musical scores. Um, so we've got, you know, just a substantial cost there, not to mention the cost of, 
you know, ticketing and credit card charges and all of that other stuff that's sort of away from the production side. Um, but from the production side, um, the set costumes, whether we have to rent lights, um, you know, certainly de depending on whether it's a period piece and we have stuff in stock, sometimes the period stuff was made for someone with a 28 inch waist and good luck finding an actor this in, in this day and age with a 28 inch waist. Um, so, you know, depending on that, the, the cost of, a, of the show could be $2,500. It could be over 5,000, mm. depending on the complexity of the set, you know, since COVID, how many sheets of plywood at $130 a sheet or whatever the cost, right? Like, so it, that is definitely a cost. And then the next production may use some of the plywood the last production bought and their budget may be lower because we were able to use stuff that was in stock, those kinds of things. But um, no, the, the, the cost is certainly, um, is certainly a factor, but, you know, we're very fortunate that our ticket sales enable us to um, take on challenges without the fear that we can't put the financial support towards them to do them the way they need to be done. Okay. Again, thank you for that information. I think it puts things in a really good uh, context. We've been talking about costs, but I think the really important thing is that it's all done by volunteers, anywhere mm -hmm. from actors to the of the whole ticket sales, memberships, everything. You are, are run by uh, a great group of volunteers. Like, how many are yeah. there? And uh, yeah, so we have a, a. By the end of the season, we are normally in around two hundred volunteers. Mm -hmm. um, and then you know, when the next season comes, people often some people join automatically. We have about, um, and I'm going to throw a number around forty um, honorary members. So those are members that have been with us for 25 years or more um, and they no longer pay membership, but they're sort of carried over and they're, you know, involved in shows. Some of our honorary members are retired and aren't as involved as they were once, but um, over the course of the season, as shows come on, people join up and, and help out. Um, but yeah, without our volunteers, we would be nothing. And we're very fortunate that, um, you know, the, the theater community, um, some members of our of our group are only members of the Curtain Club and work solidly with this group. And there are lots of members out there that may do a show in Aurora, they may do a show in Markham, they may do a show downtown, you know, that sort of, uh, they may light a show somewhere else. I've done set designs in at Black Horse years ago, you know, so depending on what we get asked to do and what we help to do, the community is pretty good at supporting each other when someone needs um, you know, if you need a set piece that Markham has, Markham will loan it to us and vice versa. And, you know, we've got costumes and projectors from Aurora. You know, the, the community is very good at, at supporting one another to make things happen. But yes, without our volunteers, we would be nothing. Yeah. Okay. Uh, good to hear. There are so many good people out there doing, helping you out and being mm -hmm. part of this. Though I, uh, I do think you get a lot from what you give. <laughs> Absolutely. So this season's opening night is September 15th uh, with the production of the Fly Fisher's Companion, and it runs until September 30th. Each show has 13 performances, with two of them being Sunday matinees, correct? Correct. Okay, so... It is, this is our second season with uh, two Sunday matinees, um, mm -hmm. and it's... Uh, you know, it's it's very it's a very positive piece as um, people transition through lives, um, driving at night, and you know, want, having other other things to do makes it possible. And uh, it's really been a big success for us and for our member for our, for our subscribers. Yeah, and I definitely think the matinees you're doing a real service to you know very, the older crowd that still yeah. wants needs to get out, but for lots of good reasons. Uh, you know some. Some of your shows, you know, I'm getting home 1030 at night, uh, which can be late for some. And I only live 10 minutes from the club. So, uh, yeah, it's. Yeah, yeah. I think well, it's and we, and we have subscribers that drive um, an hour and a half to see yeah. every show. Wow. We, we okay. have people that come from all over the place. It's really amazing. Okay. I, I think one of the great things about the Curtain Club is that it's in your community. You can get there easily. And you usually see people that you know. And I think that's uh, one of the attractions for going to the Curtain Club, for me at least. 
Okay. Yeah. So can you remind me what the ticket prices are and subscription prices? So tickets this season are $24. Um, there was a modest ticket increase this year. And um, unfortunately, due to the cost of everything over the last few years, yeah. um, they have, we touched on that a bit earlier, um, we, you know, we had no choice uh, mm -hmm. but to increase our ticket price. So it's $24 across the board. Um, tickets can be purchased online at thecurtainclub.org. Mm -hmm. And um, yes, it certainly makes sense buying a subscription. You can save up to 34% by buying a subscription, subscription off the regular ticket price. And, uh, you know, we do have, we have people that uh, spend the entire month of January and February in, uh, in Florida that still buy subscriptions and they give their winter show away to family. Um, so we sometimes get people, other people showing up with their tickets because snowbirds are giving them out at Christmas, which is a great idea. And yeah, you still no, save money. So definitely it is. And yeah. uh, I know I've, uh, you know, I like to go opening night just because excitement. I like to be able to tell other people about the show. But sometimes I have something comes up and I can't go opening night and uh, just give you guys a call, send you an email. And I usually can find the other date uh, to go there. So it's a. Uh, yeah. Buying a subscription doesn't lock you specifically into a certain time. You you do have flexibility. I think I have to give you a tuny, but I'm not complaining. So yeah. yeah. Is there anything else that you'd like to add, Wayne? Um yeah, there is actually, because it's um I want to thank you. I think you know, this is not just about us. Without the support of our community and people like you, um, we would not have the rich, diverse community that we have today in Richmond Hill. And know that your efforts are very much appre appreciated by this community. Okay, Th thank you, Wayne. It's uh, there are a lot of good people I see going to the Curtain Club. So yeah, but we all need a band leader. Yeah, <laughs> you're you're a good band leader. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, I do end podcasts asking the same question of every guest. Can you please name just one thing? that you really like about this community? The people. Mm. I think the people. Um, we have a fantastically talented group of people that put their hearts and souls and money. Like we don't, you know, so we don't pay mileage. If a volunteer comes to the Curtain Club three times a week from rehearsal and they drive from Newmarket or Toronto or Richmond Hill, the, the gas is out of their own pockets, right? So these people... They, they have a passion to do this. They want to do it. Um, and certainly, um, and, and the fact that you get, it's not often that you get to hang out with people that are in high school or in their 90s. And there's something to be said from a community that is diverse in age, diverse in color, diverse in sexual orientation, just, we just, diverse in culture, diverse, like, we're very, we're very fortunate that we have um, um, a community of wonderful people that are all rowing in the same direction. Very well said. Thank you, Wayne. So, yeah, again, thank you, Wayne, for taking the time to do this podcast. And I'm looking forward to seeing you on, at the Curtain Club very soon. Thank you for listening. I would very much appreciate you sharing this podcast Please tune in next week as we continue to explore the community. Consider emailing me at marj, M-A-R-J, at marjandre.com. I welcome suggestions for podcast guests. Stay well, stay connected.